to the share my screen. So Edwin is going to talk about Martingale posteriors by an uncertainty via imputation. Can everyone see my slides? We can. I don't. Yeah, okay. So hi everyone, my name is Edwin. Uh, I'm a PhD student at Oxford uh, and I'm presenting from Hong Kong today, uh, all on my own. So uh, today I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the joint work I did with my supervisor, Chris and uh, collaborator, Stephen. Uh, and it's titled Martingale Posteriors Bayesian Uncertainty via Imputation. And so for those who are interested, um, this is based on some work we recently put on archive. So please check that out afterwards if you find this interesting. Okay, so um, in, within the context of this uh, conference, we're looking at combating issues such as computational scalability and intractable likelihoods. Um, but one approach, which is a little bit tangential, I guess, to the main theme of this conference is that one can seek to instead generalize Bayesian inference instead of trying to approximate the exact Bayesian posterior. And so to that end, some obvious examples are plugging in the likelihood with the tractable approximation. So this would consist of things like pseudo and composite likelihoods, where you just plug it in and do Bayes rule normally. The line of work that I'm interested in is actually replacing the likelihood with the loss function. So we identify a parameter of interest directly through this loss function and then motivate another update for the prior to the posterior um, through some other argument. So for example, if you argue through the coherence of belief updating, you get general Bayesian updating, which is um, work by Basiri. And I think there'll be some talks later on that actually use this framework. Um, another way to look at it is to treat Bayesian inference as an optimization scheme where the posterior is your goal and that's generalized variational inference. And finally, the one that's more um, connected to what we're gonna talk about today is putting a non-parametric prior on the sampling distribution directly and targeting some parameter through a loss function. And so this would result in things like the Bayesian bootstrap. So for those who are unfamiliar, the Bayesian bootstrap is um, a similar thing to the frequentist bootstrap, where instead of simulating multinomial weights, you have these smooth Dirichlet weights, which sometimes seem to come out of nowhere, but um, actually have quite an interesting interpretation. Uh, and today we're gonna take this one step further. We're actually going to replace both the likelihood and prior with a loss function and a predictive distribution instead. And if we're careful with the elicitation of this predictive distribution, then we actually end up with something that's very similar and more general than the Bayesian posterior. And we denote this as the Martingale posterior. So to start this, we went back to fundamentals and took a look at what the underlying cause of Bayesian uncertainty was. And so to us, the statistical uncertainty clearly arises because you only observe a finite sample, Y1 to N, say IID from some population, um, instead of the, in the entire population. And so the usual Bayesian update is to elicit the likelihood, hopefully well-specified and a prior and an update from the prior to the posterior through Bayes rule. Uh, also, this, this will be useful later, but this gives us a posterior predictive for one step ahead. And the question we asked was, what is the actual source of Bayesian uncertainty? So at first glance, it might seem like it's the prior, but it doesn't really correspond directly to what we mentioned before about statistical uncertainty arising from a finite sample. Um, so the way we like to imagine this is that given the infinite population, Y1 to infinity, any parameter of interest, including, of course, the likelihood indexing parameter, would be known precisely, assuming some estimator theta exists, which in, in this sense it does. Um, and so since that's the thing that we don't have, ym plus 1 to infinity, we argue that the source of Bayesian uncertainty is actually this unobserved remainder of the population, ym plus 1 to infinity. Um, and we're going to see shortly that the Bayesian actually deals with this in a, in a very formal way. Um, we're going to look at Bayesian uncertainty as essentially predictive imputation for the remainder of the population, which we need to compute any parameter of interest. So to look at Bayesian uncertainty as an imputation, what we can do is we can look at the joint predictive distribution. Um, and for convenience, it's helpful to write this as a prequential factorization. Um, we've informally written it as this infinite product, but you can think of this through, uh, you can do this formally through limits. So let's say our Bayesian model implies this joint predictive distribution on the remainder of the population given our observed sample. And it's just the product of the one step ahead predictives starting at um, y1 to n. We can imagine imputing a data set ym plus one to infinity from this predictive distribution in essentially a bootstrap way. And given this imputed population, we can then compute any parameter of estimate, and in particular, the likelihood parameter um, through some estimator theta, which I put a footnote here because there's a little bit of technicality with that, but it does exist. Um, and so looking at this simulation scheme, it looks a lot like a bootstrap where we've actually imputed the remainder of the population. And so because the remainder of the population is random, but of course the observed, the observed sample is not, we now have a distribution on this bootstrap parameter of interest, conditional on y1 to n. And so the really cool property is that from Dube's consistency theorem, if you're careful with your parameter estimate, you can actually show that indeed theta infinity is distributed according to the posterior distribution. So in summary, 
the Bayesian you can imagine as actually imputing the remainder of the population, which one needs to compute any parameter of interest, very much like a bootstrap scheme, computing this parameter of interest as if we've seen the whole data set. And the uncertainty in this bootstrap parameter theta is exactly from the posterior distribution. What's really nice about this interpretation is that it's quite clear that this is where the uncertainty is coming from. And the Bayesian is very direct in terms of directly simulating it or eliciting a, a subjective predictive distribution over it. Now more onto a practical note, notice that we factorize this joint distribution to a sequence of predictives, uh, one step ahead predictives. It's particularly useful computationally as well. Uh, and so there's this sequential imputation scheme that's quite obvious. And we denote this as predictive resampling where instead of simulating from the joint, you actually simulate from the one step ahead in a sequential manner. So um, there's an outer loop for the number of posterior samples. There's an inner loop where we essentially sample y n plus one from the predictive density at time n. We update to the new predictive distribution. We sample y n plus two, and we continue this off to infinity or some large integer approximating infinity. And this is of course equivalent to sampling from the joint distribution. And then at the end, you just compute this um, parameter of interest. So we call this sequential imputation scheme, which is really helpful later on. Um, as predictive resampling uh, inspired by the bootstrap. And so um, before we move on to generalizing it formally, we can actually demonstrate this with a nice little parametric example. So conjugate normal model with some conjugate prior, then the one step ahead predictive distribution will always be normal from conjugacy. So what you can do here on the plot on the left is you can run these Ford simulations where we predictively resample as we described before, yn plus one, and then update yn plus two, update, so this is sampling from the joint. At the same time, we can compute an estimate of this parameter theta. Um, we're using the posterior mean, but it just needs to be a strongly consistent estimator. Um, and you can see that as you impute the population, well, we know more and more of the population, then we actually converge to these, these constants. But these constants, of course, have random location depending on how we've imputed the data set. Now, if you look at the distribution of where these thetas, these estimated thetas have converged to, then indeed, the density is very close to the tractable analytical posterior density. And from Dupe's theorem, we know this is exact in the limit of um, simulating off to infinity. So armed with this new interpretation of um, Bayesian inference, um, we can then just directly consider a more general one step ahead sequence of predictive distributions, starting at n plus one, noting you don't actually have to go all the way back in time. Um, and of course, just defining some parameter of interest directly. Uh, and so you've obfuscated the need for the likelihood and prior. Of course, you can use the likelihood and prior to construct this predictive distribution and you don't have to go through this roundabout way of doing things. But if you wanted to work directly with the predictive, then this is one way of getting Bayesian uncertainty. So as we mentioned before, the first step is to do predictive resampling. So this is the generating in the sequential manner, imputing the remainder of the population that we haven't seen. So we draw this off to infinity or some big capital N until we have uh, a random population y1 to infinity, noting of course that the first n data points are fixed at the observed values. Um, and this is where the posterior uncertainty comes from. Now, given this population, we can then compute any parameter of interest. Um, and in particular, we're gonna look at some ways to specify this. So one way is to specify this through the argument of the expected loss function of this random distribution f infinity. And so f infinity is actually the limiting empirical distribution as we carry out this sequential imputation scheme. And of course, we have to be careful to ensure that f infinity actually exists. Um, and that's going to be what we're going to talk about next. So we're going to break these two steps down um, roughly. There's a lot of detail in the paper, but we'll try to summarize some of the key ideas. Uh, and as we mentioned before, we have a large but finite n usually. So um, you can't actually simulate an infinite population, of course. Um, but there's also this nice interpretation um, and there's some connections to finite population Bayesian inference where this truncation parameter can be treated as the size of the population that you're interested in. So as we said before, we need to be careful when we elicit this general sequence of one step ahead predictive. Bayes rule sort of handles this all for us, but if we're doing this directly, we need to be really careful to ensure that limits exist when we impute the data set. And so in particular, one, we have these arguments through predictive coherence, but in summary, when we're predictive resampling, that is we're drawing sequentially from the predictive distribution and updating, it's sufficient to just have a, a martingale condition. So we just need that our predictive density updated with this data point yn plus one. Conditionally expected, uh, the conditional expectation of this is just the old predictive density. And so this type of good behavior ensures that when we do predictive resampling, we indeed converge to something of interest uh, instead of just wandering off uh, to infinity. Um, and there's actually a lot more formal mathematics behind this. So the imputed population can actually be regarded as something called conditionally identically distributed or CID. This was introduced in Bertie in 2004. 
Um, and it's really nice because there's a lot of similar asymptotics with respect to, to Bayesian models. It's essentially a form of predictive invariance where we treat future data points at the current time um, as being marginally identically distributed, hence the name here. Uh, and it's a direct weakening of exchangeability. So actually this is somewhat problematic. We have to average over permutations when we compute predictive densities just to essentially remove some of the dependency on this. But we'll see shortly that because things are so fast, it's not, it's not a big deal when we're computing these predictive densities. The thing that's probably more of interest, um, but we don't really go into too much detail, is to actually how, how we go about defining this parameter of interest um, when we're doing this bootstrap scheme. And so taking a step back, we have to assume, of course, that our data is IID from some unknown sampling distribution F0. We can be really explicit about the parameter we're interested in as minimizing the expected loss function. And we see here that F0 takes the place of F infinity that we saw before, this random limiting empirical distribution from um, imputing our data set randomly. And so examples are pretty obvious. We can have the loss function as this absolute value, which gives the median, or the squared error, which gives the mean. Um, and one that's particular of interest is if we're actually interested in parametric models, but we would like to have a non-parametric predictive, which we're going to look at now, is to actually set the loss function equal to some uh, the negative log likelihood of some parametric model, or perhaps some pseudo likelihood or partial likelihood. Um, there's a lot more detail that can be investigated with respect to how this fits into the ABC framework, of course, but um, we're just noting this for now. And in this case, you'd be essentially computing uncertainty on some parameter that minimizes this KL divergence between your likelihood and F0, um, while at the same time, not essentially assuming that that's the underlying model. So to summarize, um, we've introduced this predictive framework for inference, where instead of specifying a likelihood in a prior, we're gonna specify the sequence of one step ahead predictive densities or distributions. We're gonna impute this remainder of the population, Yn plus one to infinity from the joint predictive implied by this uh, through predictive resampling. And then given this imputed population, we'll just compute some parameter of interest and that gives us a sample from our distribution, our posterior distribution. Um, and of course, the reason why we went about generalizing this is, um, this is in fact a generalization of Bayesian inference as we mentioned before. So if we choose our posterior predict, uh, if, our if we choose our one step predictive distribution to simply be the posterior predictive and our parameter of interest is the one indexing the likelihood, then of course we return the Bayesian posterior. One thing which we won't talk about too much today, but actually is one of the biggest motivations and particularly interesting because it's also a very computationally pleasant, uh, computationally feasible methodology, is that if you elicit the predictive distribution to be this empirical distribution, so it's just one over n at each of the atoms, which is very intuitive, from the polya urn scheme, you actually return the Bayesian bootstrap. Uh, and also, this is a really nice vessel for comparing the Bayesian bootstrap and the frequentist bootstrap. You can really see where the, differ the difference lies. They're both essentially uh, resampling schemes, but done in a different way. And the one that we're going to talk about um, quickly now is, of course, more general uh, predictive distributions, which aren't uh, implied through a likelihood and a prior. And so if our predictive distribution is CID, we have all these nice predictive coherence conditions, all our limits exist, and we denote this as Martin Gap posterior. Now, in terms of a practical tool, we actually need a sort of efficient online updating of predictives. Otherwise, we can't have any hope at trying to do predictive resampling. Um, but we'll see shortly that there's actually this really useful tool, um, this really useful characterization of this Bayesian update through the use of a bivariate copula. So just a quick intro into bivariate copulas. A bivariate copula um, is a joint density on uniform random variables. Um, so it's a function from 0, 1 squared to r. And essentially, if we marginalize out each of these u's or the v's, then we, we get the uniform density. And u and v lie on 0 and 1. And the reason why bivariate copulas are so interesting is through Scarves theorem. So they model dependency. Now, any bivariate density can be written of the form here. So the joint density F on Y1 and Y2 can be written as this product of this copula term and the marginal densities. So here, the marginal densities clearly have no, no dependent structure. It's just the marginal density at Y1, marginal density at Y2. All of the dependent structure is encoded through this bivariate copula here, which takes as input the CDF, the marginal CDF at Y1, and the marginal CDF at Y2. Uh, and so you can see here, this, this decomposition captures the dependence. And just for some familiarity, we're actually going to be working directly with this Gaussian copula density. So this, has, um, this is a bivariate density with some parameter rho, which is this correlation parameter that lies between 0 and 1. Uh, actually, it can go to minus 1, but we're not going to consider that. And, and so here, the bivariate copula density is just the ratio of the multivariate uh, bivariate normal density with correlation rho um, divided by its marginals, which are just standard normals. So you can see how. In this equation, we have the, the 
the joint structure divided by the marginal structure, hence leaving us with um, some notion of just dependence. And the reason why the copula is really useful is um, this update was introduced in this paper by Han et al, where they use essentially the copula density to update predictive densities directly. But usually, but they were only concerned with going up to um, P of n, and we're essentially taking that off to infinity. So the reason why bivariate copulas are really helpful is that we can consider these recursive updates. So let's say we have some predictive density given y1 to i, we observe yi plus one, and then we update to this new predictive density conditional on y1 uh, to i plus one. Then we can write out the form here where the new predictive density is the old predictive density multiplied by this copula term here. So this is a sequence, c is a sequence of copulas, which take as input the marginal CDFs. So in this case, the marginal CDFs of this two-step joint would be pi of y, the CDF uh, observed at this test point. And where the data comes in is this CDF term here of y i plus one. And so the copula encodes the dependence between what we think the CDF or density at the value y should be relative to y i plus one. We're gonna see shortly, this actually looks a lot like, um, it's gonna be really intuitive. This looks a bit like a, a kernel essentially from the KDE. And so in Han et al's paper, they introduced this um, sequence of copulas. And their motivation was that all Bayesian models actually have this underlying copula sequence because all Bayesian models have an implied bivariate joint densities, of course, but um, they're not tractable in the general case. And so their solution was to pick a tractable sequence, which might not be exchangeable, hence this need to average over permutations. But if it's tractable, then we can actually just compute this predictive density directly in this nice online fashion. And so, as I said before, they use this to estimate the predictive density up until time n, um, but because of this construction of the copula, you can show essentially by integrating this out over yi plus one. If we're doing predictive resampling, it will always satisfy the Martingale condition just by construction. And so this makes it a perfect candidate um, for predictive resampling because well, A, it satisfies coherence and it's also online. And we'll also see some, some nice computa computational tricks that will come up later. So more onto a specific case of actually how to specify this sequence of copulas, because it's not really obvious um, how to do that first. Han et al. looked to the Dirichlet process mixture for inspiration. So the DP mixture model is a Bayesian non-parametric model, it's an extension of the Gaussian mixture model. And what's really neat is that the first step, so the update from P0 to P1 is tractable. Uh, and so if you use that as your inspiration and essentially generalize this to remain tractable for i greater than n, you have this nice update which is um, all terms are tractable and you can compute them exactly. And so in this case, we're taking a mixture of the independent copula and the Gaussian copula, but it's more useful to look at it as a weighted sum of two, two densities. So on the left here, we have this weighted sum of the old predictive density. On the right here, we have this weighted sum of something we call the copula kernel. So it's the C term times the old predictive density with all these uh, annoying things that come into the input. And we'll, we'll, we'll see shortly what this looks like and why it's really intuitive. Um, and as we mentioned before, C is just the Gaussian copula density parameterized by rho, and our um, alpha i's have to be order n minus one to make sure we're getting the right amount of weighting per data point. Actually, we have a very specific recommendation for this. We're not, we don't leave this for um, the user to specify, but we won't go into details here because the derivation is a little bit um, tedious. And so the reason why this update is so nice is it actually looks a lot like the KDE, but in an online way, and it's guaranteed to satisfy this CID condition, which is um, crucial for our predictive resampling. So the way you can look at this is um, a KDE with bandwidth rho, which lies between zero and one. And as you go to one, you have more and more peakness. So on the plot on the left, in the dotted line, we have the old predictive density PI. Uh, in the solid lines, we have this copula kernel, which you can see is centered at this data point yi plus one that we're updating it with. And so as you increase the bandwidth, you can see that the kernel gets more and more peaked about yi plus one. So it really does look like a KDE with some bandwidth that you're decreasing. Um, but the important thing to note here is that the bandwidth is data dependent. It depends on PI, which is the predictive density at time I. So it depends on all the data points from before, uh, which is why we have this really nice martingale structure. Um, you can actually prove that the normal KDE, you can't get it to be a martingale. Then on the right, you have this nice weighted sum. Uh, now on the right, we have the full update. So P of I plus one is this weighted sum of this dotted line with these solid lines. And of course, it's just a, it's just a mixture term. So you just see there's a little bump at Y plus one. And as you increase the bandwidth, you have more and more peakness about this data point yi plus one. Now onto the reason why this is particularly useful for predictive resampling. As we saw just now, this update is online. So we only need the previous predictive density. We don't need to recompute and fit an entire model at each time point. 
It's also kind of Bayesian because it's inspired through this um, construction. And in fact, it's, it's formally always CID. So we have all these really nice properties, um, including all these nice asymptotic properties when we do predictive resampling. The only real gripe is that we have the average over permutations, but there's actually some theory to show you don't really need to do that either if you're simulating up to infinity. Um, but the really cool thing is this, this neat little computational trick that comes up because of the way the copula update is structured. So as we mentioned before, for predictive resampling, we want to do sequential imputation and updating. Um, so let's look at the first step. So obviously we have to learn the predicted density um, from the data first, y into one to n, we have this pn. Now we're going to draw y n plus one from pn and we're going to update using this y n plus one through this copula update here. So it's the weighted sum of the old density plus this copula kernel. But because we're simulating um, y n plus one from pn, note that the only place this comes in to this update is through this predictive CDF. It comes in only through as pn y n plus one. Um, so if you think inverse transform sampling, if yn plus one is distributed according to pn, then clearly the CDF is just a uniform random variable. So in practice, you don't actually need to go through some complicated, complicated procedure to simulate y from this predictive density. Instead, you actually simulate a uniform random variable, plug it into the second term of the copula, update, and then you just do this off to um, some big integer capital N. Um, so there's no really messy simulation needed, no rejection sampling. It's actually just a bunch of uniform random variables, which you plug in. So what does this look like in practice? Um, we're going to go through just a simple example, but we have some a lot more demonstrations in the paper. Um, so let's consider the classic density estimation problem for this galaxy data set where we have 82 data points. And so what you can do, one, one thing that we didn't mention is that you could actually learn this bandwidth term in a really nice way. It's essentially a marginal likelihood. You just compute the sequential log likelihood and you sum up the term. So it's data driven, it's really neat. Um, and you can use some fancy um, automatic differentiation to do this. We simulate off to some capital N. So this is this imputed population um, to be of size 5,000 plus N. Uh, in practice, this you can actually judge the convergence somewhat. Um, we have some demonstrations of this because you're converging to a constant when you do predictive resampling. Um, and then we simulate 1,000 plus three samples and we compare something coming from our copula update to something coming from the Dirichlet process mixture through, through um, MCMC. Now comparing com computation times is a little bit tricky because the, the setup is really different. So for the copula methods, you actually compute the predictive density first, P of n, which is not possible with Bayes. You actually need MCMC to get that in the first place. Um, so if you don't really care about uncertainty, you don't even need to do predictive resampling. You just compute Pn as suggested by Han. But you could also, of course, just simulate off um, to infinity. And so we run our experiments on the GPU for the copula because they're particularly suited for that. Think of having a big grid of density values um, and then computing weighted sums and nonlinear transformations. It works really well in this framework. And actually, for those who are familiar, um, JAX, this program in Python, is, this um, package in Python is actually perfect because it allows you to do um, JIT, this just-in-time compilation. So you get really fast for loops as well as GPU um, dependency. So for this predicted density, it only takes about half a second. Um, and this is including this averaging over permutations business. And for predictive resampling, it takes about two seconds on this GPU. Uh, of course, you can also parallelize this because each of these, in each of these Martingale posterior step samples can be drawn independently. Now from the, for, for, for Bayes, we run this on the CPU because there isn't a particularly um, helpful implementation in GPU and it takes about 25 seconds, but just take this comparison with a grain of salt because it, of course it depends on the grid size as well for the copula method. Um, and there's also this issue of parallelization. Now in the below, we have the, the figure of these plots of these um, predictive densities drawn off to infinity. So, uh, in black, we have the posterior mean. On the left is the Martingale posterior mean, and on the right is just the usual Dirichlet process posterior mean um, estimate of the density. And what you can imagine is drawing all these um, imputed populations of the infinity and checking what the predictive density is at the end. It'll be a random p infinity, and you can take that as a sample of this density. And then if you plot the 95% credible intervals, you can see that you get something, uh, of course, different to Bayes, but still similar in that it puts uncertainty in the right place. Given this random sample, you can treat this P infinity or P capital N as um, essentially the same thing as the limiting empirical distribution. We have some maths to show that it's um, in the limit is the same thing. Um, so what you can do is you can compute any statistic of interest from this limit, this random predictive density that you've drawn through predictive resampling. So of course you can just count the number of modes or you can compute the quantiles. And this is what we've shown here. So on the left, you have the posterior number of modes for the copula method. It's um, peaked at about four. Whereas for the Dirichlet process, make sure it's peaked at five. And likewise, the quantiles look similar, but different. And so in the case of the quantiles, because the updates for the CDFs are also tractable, you can also just check what the CDF is at the end of this predictive imputation. 
um, and just pick off where the quartile is from this random CDF. So um, some conclusions. We looked at Bayesian inference foundationally from this point of view of imputation, of sequential imputation where we impute this remainder of the population, which is what we need to compute any parameter of interest. And it looks a lot like a bootstrap. Uh, and this bootstrap inter interpretation is actually really insightful. So we have a bit of a section in the paper about this, where you can actually regard Bayesian uncertainty as clearly trying to impute yn plus one to infinity, whereas the frequentist is trying to resample y1 to n. But the predictive distribution used in both cases are the same. They're just the empirical distribution. So it's really neat, um, in my opinion, at least, it shows where the Bayesian and the frequentist differs. In terms of methodology, we can use this predictive framework by considering more general predictive distributions and more general parameters of interest. So you don't really need a likelihood and prior, but of course you're free to use one if you'd like to. Uh, and in particular, bivariate copulas are a really useful tool for predictive coherence. One more thing that we didn't talk about today because it's quite a lot of um, background necessary. We actually spent a lot of time in the paper extending this univariate copula methodology for multivariate density estimation and regression. And you can do similar things such as predictive resampling and everything remains tractable and nice. So um, even if you're not interested in getting uncertainty, there's still some interest in computing these predictive densities directly. Um, essentially you skip MCMC. Um, so thanks for your time. And for those who are interested, please check out our paper and archive and I'm happy to take any questions now. Uh, Thank you very much, Edwin. Um, are you done? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to show the references, but you can check that on the on the slides online. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. Or you can show the yeah. references. Fine. Yeah. yeah. So there's two pages. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Thank you very much. Um, has anybody any question? Yeah. So I uh, yeah I had a question, if possible. So thank you very much for a nice talk. Uh, I was wondering, um, I mean, it, it looks like, let's say from, from a standard prior like you, if you define it in the standard way, a prior and the like you, you can get, um, you can get your predictive distribution, right? Mm -hmm. But what, uh, what happens if the other way around? So I was wondering if you set a given uh, predictive distribution, does it correspond uh, in, in, a uni in a unique way to a prior like you pair or not? Um, actually, that's quite interesting. So because CID models, specifically for CID models, um, they're in the limit, they're exchangeable. So asymptotically, they're exchangeable. You can, um, set, that means that there is technically an underlying prior, but it'll be non-parametric on F. Um, so yeah, in, in the CID case, it does exist because asymptotically, you do have exchangeability. So you, you have definities asymptotically, essentially. But in general, it's not, it's not super obvious. Like from our copulas, we wouldn't be able to actually plot this prior. Maybe we'd be able to simulate from it, but um, there's some work actually on, on this. So some work by um, Sandra, Sandra Fertini and Sonia Patron. They've looked at something like this for a, a one specific class of CID models. Yeah, that was going to be my question. What's the connection with the work of Sonia on this predictive inference? Oh uh, yeah, actually, so that, that's neat. Um, so Sonia Patron, uh, they're focused on predictive distributions, but they are quite emphasize this exchangeability. So their idea is that if your predictive distribution has certain conditions, including exchangeability with respect to the previous end data points, then you have this underlying um, definite type result. Uh, so here we're just, we're, we're breaking that. Um, and it's a much more, I guess it's a more practical methodological approach to looking at things. Yeah, yeah I had an, another question, which was, um, so when you do the Bayesian bootstrap, mm -hmm. you have a sort of uh, this nice result that says that uh, the estimator for theta is uh, asymptotically normal and the vari asymptotic variance is a sandwich variance. Uh, so you're robust to model misspecification in these regards. Do you have the same sort of results from like this generalized version of Bayesian bootstrap? So for the, it's tricky because it depends on your theta, but what we do have, um, and it's buried in the appendix somewhere, you have um, consistency under relatively weak conditions of the density estimator. So we treat that as dealing better with model misspecification. Like for example, the Bayesian bootstrap, um, you can think of F as also being um, somewhat consistent. Uh, in terms of actually the asymptotic distribution on theta, I think that's that's probably some future work to look at. Like um, probably looking at, if you look at Fortini's paper, they have something similar with respect to mixing measures and, and um, Newton's method, where they show some sort of asymptotic normality. So I'm, I'm keen to investigate that. Can I ask an academic question? Um, so what would be the interest of generalizing the way you've done compared to the bias and bootstrap? What are you gaining? Yeah, so that's a, that's a really good question, actually. Uh, we sort of discussed this in the paper, but didn't have time too much today. Uh, 
So the Bayesian bootstrap, it's actually really useful for, for when you have high dimensional data and some low parametric loss, because you know what F infinity is already. It's quite neat. But in some cases, such as regression, where you need continuity with respect to X, for example, the Bayesian bootstrap wouldn't work for regression. Um, if you have something like some far tail probabilities or something like modes where you, you do care about this underlying density, then um, we, we need something that's continuous, hence the couple estimation. The other thing that's a bit more subtle is that the Bayesian bootstrap, because it puts an atom at each data point, if you had any hype parameters, you wouldn't be able to learn them. So let's say we wanted to do like some sort of hierarchical Bayesian bootstrap um, where you have some centering concentration. You can't learn that because your marginal likelihood is always going to be um, the poly urn product one over n. Whereas in this case, when you have a density, you do have a marginal likelihood. So you can actually estimate things like the bandwidth or some sort of regression parameter um, in a way that is data driven. Any other questions? Okay, thanks a lot, Edwin. <laughs>